Life Podcast has our own merch now over on tpublic.com. Click the link below in the video description. Looking for some new threads? We got t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, crew neck sweatshirts, tank tops, baseball tees, and also clothes for kids and onesies for your little infant metalheads. Don't want clothes but love the Java? We got you covered with coffee mugs and travel mugs. Need protection for your electronics? We've also got phone and laptop cases. We've got everything you're looking for at the tpublic.com Music is Live podcast store. Use my link below for fast service. Thanks for your support. Terranut is proud to offer you a natural nut bar chock full of healthy fats, minerals, and protein that meet your demands. Go to their website, www.terranut.com. You can order from them directly and they will ship it to you. Use my coupon code LUMAVS and you will get a 25% discount on your first order. Terranut Superfood Snacks, www.terranut.com. Don't forget to use coupon code LUMAVS at checkout. Fuel your life. We are ready and waiting for you now If it's a fight that you dare see We've acquired our strength through pain No more are we pathetic game We you are the reason why we claim That we've all become this way And I regret this prison that Brigham Doan is the best hybrid wrestler that I've ever seen, especially yes. in the last 15 years. If ECW was still around, Ada would have been perfect for ECW. But he could do that deathmatch stuff, but man, did he work. I don't fucking work for anybody that's going to treat me like fucking shit. Music is Live Podcast. This is your host, Lou Maps. Check out everything you need to know about the show over at musicislivepodcast.com. As I end every episode, I state that all art is valid. That includes music, comics, film, and pro wrestling. My guest tonight is someone that I call an artist. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate no it. No problem. <laughs> he is, without a shadow of a doubt, the best hybrid wrestler in the sport of professional wrestling today. Getting his start in Texas, he's worked all around the world from WWE to TNA to Big Japan to Freedoms to Mexico. What many do not know, but you will now know, is that he's also a master craftsman. If you find him on social media, you'll see he has his work on display and made to order through his custom jewelry and accessory company called Exiled Artifacts. I'm very proud to have on my show the ultra-violent beast himself. And you know him by one name, Masada. <laughs> You could go with ultraviolet. I mean, it's kind of hot in Texas, so pretty soon I'll be turning purple. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. Keep, I'm actually in my workspace right now as we're talking. It's probably like 105 degrees in, in uh, San Antonio, so yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start changing colors just because of the heat. <laughs> it's 90 in New York right now, and like I'm in an air-conditioned room, but it's hot as balls because I got the halogen light on me, so it could uh, you know, look professional oh, no. in here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, I sympathize, you know, got the light right there on me, so, yeah. <laughs> there you go. By the way, this is a first. The guest and I are wearing matching shirts, my Masada yeah. t-shirt. Yes, and no weapons needed. You could buy this exclusively from Masada by finding him on social media, and I really have to put the shirt over. It's the most comfortable thing I've ever worn, so <laughs> good on you, Thank sir. You. You're not in Beaumont, Texas right now, though, right? No, no, I live in San Antonio. Yeah, my wife and I live in San Antonio. I haven't been to Beaumont, shoot, several years. But, I mean, that's where I got my start, you know. That's yeah. originally where I'm from. Actually, one of the things that made Masada and I on friendly terms was the fact that we both have a similar love for bands. Um, yeah. It just so happened one day he mentioned Soil in the Green, and I told him the story of me with Ben from Soil in the Green and Goat Whore. So the real quick story is this. I'm a college radio DJ. I'm interviewing Ben in the back of the tour bus outside the Voodoo Lounge at Bayside, Queens. Left my camera on the tour bus. A fight breaks out that night that leads into a stabbing incident. I never get my camera back. The cops come raid the place. We all have to leave. Three months later, I find Ben with Soy in the Green playing at CBGB. 
And I asked him, by the way, do you still have my camera? He's like, yeah, but you don't want it back with the photographs that we took. So I let it go. <laughs> yeah, you're probably better off. Definitely. Ah! <laughs> For sure. <laughs> still, there was that mutual camaraderie over bands. So the first thing I'm going to talk with him about is music. Masada, when we first spoke via Facebook Messenger, and this is when you were living in Bayshore, New York, mm-hmm. we were talking about our love for bands like Soul in the Green and Goat Whore. And right. Something that you brought up that was of interest to me was the fact that you used to work with Ben and Sammy Duet of Goat Whore and Acid Bath when you were 17. I really have to put Goat Whore over, probably the best live black metal band that I've ever seen. Was this your only experience working with musicians? And if not, to what extent did you work with them? Well, the thing is, like when I was 17, I actually started bouncing. I was doing security for a lot of metal clubs. So anytime Goat Whore was in... Southeast Texas, or even certain parts of Louisiana, and I was friends with bands from Southeast Texas, so I'd go on tour with them, but I was always doing security with those guys, and they were constantly in Beaumont, Texas. Like, it seemed like literally, I'd say at least like once a month, you know, they were coming down. So all the big shows, like I was always security, they really didn't know my age, but you know, hey, I had a job, you know, and I just started training to be a wrestler, so it kind of worked out. So I got a lot of bar fights, but, you know, learning experience. <laughs> but, yeah, I've known, uh, known Ben and Sammy because after the shows, like, I would always, like, hang out with them because my friends that were in bands, they were really cool with home, and they did tours in Louisiana. So that's how I became, like, friends with those guys. And uh, it's funny because I haven't seen them. Last time I saw them, I would say it's probably, like, four or five years ago here in San Antonio at uh, Paper Tiger, which used to be the White Rabbit. But it was like old times, like nothing changed. They remember me, you know, because from 17, I would say to 21, I was doing security. Is that something that you'd probably see yourself doing in the foreseeable future again or even on occasion? Security? No, (laughs) no, no. I didn't like bouncing at all, honestly. Like that was just like something I got into and it's like, hey, we're going to pay you. And if a scuffle happens, you get to fight and, you know, you don't go to jail. Okay, game. (laughs) That's a but, bargain. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I mean, I was always, like, I was fans of those guys. Like, my friends were really, really, like, deep in the acid bath. And then, you know, later on, it turned into, like, Agents of Oblivion. That's more, I don't know, kind of more depressing. But I like bands like I Hate God. Crowbar is one of my favorite bands. By Mine all too. Times. That's why I have Time Heals Nothing tattooed on my left cast. I always like the Southern Sludge, and it's like, that's where I'm from originally you know hey i mean as a kid from new york i love those bands i hate god and crowbar of course down oh yeah Get, getting to see them in concert on my 27th birthday they did a whole evening with down where their intro was about a half hour of like some of the classic bands that influenced them and that was the first time i saw live footage of artists like frank marino and stuff from sabbath that i had never seen before i was born in the wrong state and in the wrong time but whatever i mean <laughs> i'm happy to be a you fan could, yeah you could throw a coc in there too oh There's yeah a lot of good bands you know they come out like like i said southeast texas louisiana you know but new york's got the metal scene going too you know a lot of good bands that come out of there as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll always have love for the for the New York hardcore scene that I grew up part of. At the time that I was going to shows, I mean, the biggest bands were Vision of Disorder and there was Earth Crisis. But I definitely cater to, like, the older stuff. One of the things I'm grateful to Kirk Winstein for always showing love to is Carnivore. Pete Steele oh, yeah. from Typo Negative, their first band. That's, for me, the best crossover thrash band to come out of New York. Well, them and the Cro-Mags, but, you know. Oh, but- yeah. <laughs> It's funny because lately, I guess maybe like the past week and a half, I've been jamming uh, Biohazard <laughs> of all bands, you know, like, I don't know, their riffs are badass. The vocals are okay, but I like, I definitely like the guitar and then the drums, you know. Yeah, that was my gateway hardcore band. I remember seeing, um, what was the video? Uh, Punishment on Headbangers Ball yeah. back in the day. And I was <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> yeah oh yeah the, you know tells from the hard side like oh yeah and but another then, band i've been listening to they're more or less from the california area is uh lionheart you know they've been around for a while but it's like i like that style that aggressive hardcore edge to it and the vocals don't seem too uh i don't know kind of rapish you know what i mean yeah i know that uh, the guys in biohazard sans evan i don't know if he's still doing 
porn or not, but um, it's not my place to say anything. But I know that uh, the uh, other guys, Billy, Bobby, and Danny, they were just on another podcast, New York Hardcore Chronicles. So it's good to know that they're still active. I mean, I, that's another band that I love. Your entrance music has always been extreme metal. Three of the ones that I recognized are Of Me, Nobody Is Safe From My Indissonance, The Optimist by Skinless, and North of Corpus by The Last 10 Seconds of Life. By the way, thank you, because you made me a fan of Iron Dissonance's Minus the Herd CD, so good shit. Yeah, yeah. When wrestling fans hear your music, they pretty much know they could expect a wrestler who could brawl, use wrestling holds, and cleverly use the gimmicks of a match without relying on them and taking away from the storytelling of a match. And of course, Wait for it. the skewers. Right. That everyone <laughs> and their mother's ripping off right. Sorry, I rant. I didn't yeah, to. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very frustrating, but, you know, what can you do? <laughs> like, we'll get to that later. But when you choose yeah, your yeah. theme music, what is the psychology behind it? Like for your theme music in general and all the bands and songs you've chosen? I mean, the main thing is like with Ion Destiny, it's just like, you know, me no one is safe. It's like, man, there's about to be a war going on and I'm going to go out and just beat the heck out of this guy. And I've always adapted, like you said, I've always adapted other people's styles because, like, I trained to be a wrestler in Lucha Libre, technical wrestling. Before, I mean, I would say even before, but I was doing hardcore matches when I first started because it was in 99. That's what was popular. But I own Destinies is just like, man, you just imagine, like, people's heads getting stomped into the canvas, you know, when I heard that song. And then uh, when I was coming out to uh, Last 10 Seconds of Life, Norfolk Corpus, that's a period of my life where... You know, things were chaotic and things like, I was literally drinking every day and I was like depressed and just mad, mad at the world. So it was fitting because North of Corpus is San Antonio and I was back in Texas. So it's like, all right, that's it. You know, and there's a, there's a lyric in the song where it's like, uh, I'm King Kong on the church steeples, uh, waving my guns at all the wrong people. All you plastic pieces of shit can sit on my middle finger and spin. That to me was like the wrestling business. You know, so I would come out to that and I was just like, man, F all you guys, you know. <laughs> I do remember that point in your career. And I have to admit, I was genuinely concerned. And that's why I kept messaging. I was like, yeah, you know, you don't need to be around the negativity all the time. Come, you know, I, I, I was playing cover shows and I do enjoy a drink, but drink is not something that I rely on to get by. So I was like, you know, if I was trying to reach out to you if you needed like positive people in your life because i know at the time you were also living in new york but i'm really happy that you settled down you have oh, yeah. a beautiful wife now you have your daughter and it seems like between exile the artifacts and your wrestling career things are finally going your way at least i hope they are because to me that's how no, they, they definitely are. are like my wife is a big contributor to me going sober you know and i mean we've been friends for so many years and like I remember like just being on the road because I like I would do random shit in wrestling. Like I get pissed off at like CZW and I'd be like, "Hey, uh, you're in the main event tomorrow." Well, I'm not gonna be there. I'm driving back to Texas, and like I would just do random shit like that. But I remember I would call my wife. Uh, she was my friend at the time, and I was like, "Yeah, I really want to stop drinking because I could literally go 35 hours driving with two handles of like Fireball and." 10 packs of cigarettes, three cans of dip, and like five rock stars and just make that drive the whole way. And like, not the smartest thing to do, but like, no. man, I, just, I, just, I wouldn't recommend anybody doing that. I mean, I'm honestly lucky that I didn't wreck and die or get pulled over and have a DWI on my record or anything like that. But it's kind of, in that period of my life, it's like, you know, I was so busy, like, I was going overseas to Japan, and then I was going to Europe, and I was going everywhere I wanted to work, and then all of a sudden, it's like, boom, you're stuck here, like, this is what you're doing, and you're not getting paid the amount of money that you feel like you're valued, and, like, outside of wrestling, it's like, what are you supposed to do, you know, because, like I said, I started when I was 17, and it's like, in that bounce, obviously, but, you know, I, bouncing and security is not my thing, you know. At all. <laughs> but like I said, my wife is the one that really, really got me to sober up. Uh, went to AA with anger management and, uh, you know, get things in perspective of way what life is supposed to be and be more happy. You know, you go to AA, it's like 
and you hear some of the stories like, hey, my life is not that bad, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, as a fan, uh, just to see you at this place in your life, it's, uh, and by the way, we could curse on the show. It's fucking awesome. So I'm just <laughs> very happy for you, man. That's awesome. And beautiful lady, by the way. All Thank right. You. Now we get to talk about your brand, Exiled Artifacts. You've created your own jewelry and other items, accessories through your business. And I've seen the work and I own a piece you did for me, which I still have. And I'm glad I, I'm glad to say that I haven't had to use it yet. <laughs> yeah, right. I won't say what it is because I don't want to get demonetized. Not that I'm monetized anyways, <laughs> but I'm building my way there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Exiled <laughs> Artifacts, is, it specializes in custom handmade items that you create on your own. So what made you decide to choose this venture? Well, one of the things before I even got into wrestling, like my mom was actually like super big in like crafts and like, you know, working with tools, you know, it's crazy. So when I was little, like we would always do like projects, you know? And I remember when I was, I was either 13 or 14, but I went to Tandy Leather and they had a, a class for leather, leather making. So my mom entered me in it and, we both took the class together and I remember seeing like a Hawaiian necklace for the first time because they were selling them there. I was like, wow, that is so cool. And then learning the history behind it and everything. I was like, I'm sure I can make that. So gradually it's like, once we passed the class, it was just, I was making things with my mom and uh, being in the metal scene. It's like, I always like the lead singers, like leather cuffs, the crazy necklaces they wore, like Max Cavalera, like with the bone carvings. I was like, man, that's badass. Internet wasn't really popular there. So you didn't really have a, the opportunity to look something up and just say, okay, you know, I could buy that. So a lot of stuff I just made and gradually picked up and, you know, thinking years later when I wrestled in Japan, it's like, you know, fans are buying my shirts. It's like, I've always wanted to have a storefront and make my own things. And uh, that's where we're at right now. So I actually do leather cuffs, chainmail, uh, bone necklaces, Maori style and Hawaiian and forging out knives and stock removal of uh, knives. So pretty much anything you can think of, I'll make it. One of the coolest things that I saw that you do is something that people could see on WWE television. You created the armor for the Viking Raiders, formerly known as War Machine in Ring of Honor in New Japan. I know that you mm -hmm. have a past history with uh, Raymond Rowe, who's one half of the tag team, and yeah. it's great that they put your work out on a platform as widely distributed as WWE. Can you provide some of the backstory about how that came through? Well, the, the crazy thing is, so Ray Rowe knew that I did leather work, and he always had like this armor that he got from the Renaissance Festival when he lived in Texas. And he was always like complaining about how it was like literally it would shape off his skin just going to the ring. And like I looked at it, I was like, man, that's really crappily made, you know? It was thick leather. It wasn't smooth on the inside. I was like, man, I can make you something if you want. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'll think about it. He's like, all right, whatever. But uh, one of the times, like I actually, I was coming back from Mexico and I got stuck in Dallas and I had to make an ACW show. And he was already in Dallas with Ring of Honor. So I, I just messaged him. I was like, hey, man, I'm actually in Dallas. And uh, my flight's canceled to go back to Austin to make ACW. And he's like, I'll just pick you up. I was like, okay, cool. So I said, oh, thank you. I actually made that armor for him. You know, And uh, I just got asked him some ideas. Like, what do you want exactly? And he showed me some pictures. I was like, yeah, I, I can make that. No problem. So that's what happened. You know, It's like, hey, I'm going to make that. He didn't believe me. And it's like, I did. Gave it to him as a gift. That is awesome. Um, have there been any other instances where public figures have used your work to such a degree? Yeah, I mean, if if you look at uh, John Moxley when he uh, debuted for uh, New Japan, once he got released from WWE or he decided to go, uh, the trench knife that's in that video where it's stabbing into the bar. Um, I don't know if you ever seen it by chance. I did, but um, I, yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a Mox fan. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Well, that trench knife, I made that. That's actually a big order. Like, a lot of people like it. And, you know, I've made probably, shoot, that's eight or nine of them, you know? And when I start making them, it's not like it takes me a week. It takes me close to, like, a month because I have to forge everything out, heat treat it, temper it, resurface it, grind it, and get a mirror finish on it. And then uh, with that knife in particular, it's actually a bone handle. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. But, um... Yeah, that's definitely another one, you know, the trench knife that Moxley, you know, in his video. And if people want to contact 
uh, you from seeing this episode. If they want to purchase anything from Magzile Artifacts, what's the best way to contact uh, you? Is it through Facebook or Instagram? Uh, it's honestly, the best way is Instagram or Facebook. Facebook, more or less, is probably like the best route to go. Mm -hmm. Because with Instagram, I have to go on there and accept people. You know, they do the request. Uh, my wife is the one that more or less handles all that stuff. So she'll tell me like, hey, there's an order here. And I'm like, okay, uh, what exactly is it? What do they want? And then I'll sketch it, draw it out, and then I'll tell her to send it over. And if they like it, cool. If not, then I'll change it. As we mentioned before, you're originally from Beaumont, Texas, and you talked about your life becoming a wrestler and also at the same time bouncing for other bands. How do you feel like Beaumont itself as an environment shaped you? Uh, honestly, like Beaumont, Texas is like really, it's, it's more or less like it's a hard grit, like street life. Believe it or not, you know, it's kind of like the slums of like Texas is it's got such a diverse culture where it's like, it's pretty violent, honestly. Like if you were to Google Beaumont, Texas, it brings up there like one of the most violent cities, uh, as far as like a small city goes in Texas. But, you know, gradually, I mean, it's just growing up in that environment. So it'd be street smart and like, watch what you say and like keep a weary eye on people, you know, they're shady, you know. And ultimately, it's like going to like the bigger cities, like say like New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia. It's like I kind of know how to act around people where it's like, I'm not going to be like, hey, what's going up, guys? Like, you never know. <laughs> so, I mean, I keep my guard up, you know, constantly. But, you know, you have to be smart these days. People are crazy. But I mean, that's how I grew up. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to disagree with that statement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean honestly, it's like, it's, it's like one of those crazy places, like, if you go to a bar, people just literally want to get trashed or they want to fight, you know, and that's no joke. Like, people just want to fight because they're mad at the world or just whatever their reason being. There's a lot of dumb rednecks out there, so you got to hold your own. Sounds like an Irish wedding to me. I've been to a couple myself, but <laughs> I can say that my wife is Irish. It's okay. Anyway. There you go. <laughs> uh, when training in Texas, you trained at the Texas Wrestling Academy under Rudy mm -hmm. Boy Gonzalez. You wrestled in NWA Wildside, TNA, WWE. You built your name in Big Japan Pro Wrestling, which took the deathmatch art form of wrestling from Atsushi Onita's FMW to a whole extreme level of ultraviolence. There were other American wrestlers that made their way there, including wrestlers from CZW in 2000. And Mike Samples, your name stands out the most because of matches with the crazy monkey, Jun Kasai, and one of your legitimately heated rivalries with Ito Ruji. Couple of questions regarding Big Japan. What was the culture shock like for you when you first made your way to Japan? Honestly, like when I first went to Japan, I was like, oh, I'm really excited. This is awesome. Like, this has always been a dream of mine to go uh, overseas. Yeah, it's just like things are so different. I hated it the first 90 days I was there because a lot of people don't know. It's like, I didn't go over there and do tours. I went and did series. I was always over there for three months at a time. And then gradually it turned into years. It's just, honestly, it's like the level of technology and the way people are. Like, you can get in an argument, like, say, for example, like my former boss, Osaka. You could point and prove that he was wrong on what he thought, and it didn't matter. He was going to stick to his word. And that's a lot of, like, how... Japan is. The Japanese people are very hardcore in their beliefs and you're not going to change them, even if you prove them wrong. But that's one of the things that I always got along with Jun Kasai and Sasaki Takashi and Segimoto is like the Japanese, but they were more Americanized with like wrestling or just like culture in general, you know? So they were more open to my ideas. And that's like when I left Big Japan and I went to Freedoms, like Kasai was really open to like my ideas and like things that we did and, you know, got over the crowd. But, uh, I mean, Japan's different, different culture altogether. Great. It has its ups and downs, you know. There's good parts and there's bad parts about it. Any plans in the foreseeable future to return to a particular promotion? Uh, I mean, honestly, if somebody made an offer, it's got to be the right type of offer for me to go over there, you know. It's realistically, it's like, okay, what I want and, I'm not going to go over there for a long period of time. It's going to have to be like a two or three day deal and then come back home. You know, that's just how it is. There's been like little hints of possibly going maybe all Japan or even uh, like DDT has been mentioned, but it just hasn't 
play where it's like the money is not right or it's just like, yeah, I don't really feel like flying 24 hours going and doing that match and then coming back home, you know. But who knows? We'll see. I don't know how things are now, especially with COVID. You know, I don't know uh, if they're even doing shows or events with fans now, you know. Luckily, I live in Texas where things are opened back up and there are events. But like I said, I don't know as far as like what's going on exactly. Come out of the loop. I hear you. I'm fortunate. I mean, because I play guitar and I've been fortunate that every show that I've played um, so far this year has been outdoors. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what it's going to be like in the fall. But, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm, I'm just hoping that things die down a little bit. I don't want to get political on the show because I avoid politics like the plague. But uh, <laughs> I just I just hope the best for everybody. I want everyone to prosper. Yeah, definitely. And if anyone has a problem with that, go fuck yourselves. Anyways, moving on, moving right along. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, yeah. You don't go anywhere sitting still, you know. <laughs> mm. There's two things that I resent about the wrestling industry and their treatment of you in particular. One is that you seem to be a gatekeeper for wrestlers that make their way to WWE. Number two, you have been ripped off by every deathmatch wrestler in the U.S. with the skewers. All of them are doing it, including members of Ricky Shane Page's crew. And even though I like him, G. Raver with the tattoo needles. I've never seen a bigger case of gimmick infringement than this. Trademark infringement. How low can you get? I swear to God. (laughs) My question to you is this. One, if the opportunity came to be signed to an American deal with either WWE or AEW, Impact, or Ring of Honor, would you take the opportunity, and why do you think they haven't asked you yet? And number two, when you see the others use it, use the skewers in their matches, and please note that I'm not basing your career on on just the skewers alone. I'm just giving credit where it's due because you started it. You did it first. You know, yeah. does it does it upset you, or does it make you think that you need to create a new approach to stand out from everybody else? Well, I mean, yeah, it's definitely upsetting because the thing is that really pissed me off. It's like the fact is like I paid my dues in the United States, and then I went to Japan and I had to repay my dues, and like staying in the dojo, learning you know Japanese psychology, and going blood and guts, balls to the wall. It's like. These guys that are doing in the United States haven't paid any dues, in my opinion. A lot of them haven't. And a lot of guys, like, I don't even know them. Never met them. So it's like, it's great that you're a mark, but then you're ripping my shit off. And then it's like, what do you think is going to happen if uh, eventually I see you? Like, if somebody tells me, because half of them, I don't know who the hell they are, but, you know, somebody's getting slapped. You know, that's the best way I could put it, you know? (laughs) Because, I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's not flattering. It's like, man, you made that look like shit. And then now you're making it so dumbed down to where it's like the new thumbtack. Like, it doesn't mean shit, you know? I was always creative with the way I, way I use them. And the psychology of the match is like, use them out of desperation. Or if it was a heated rivalry, of trying to stab them real fast and somebody and bait them in, you know, depending on their skill level. But now I just see guys, like, people tag me and stuff. And it's like, what the what is this crap? It looks like it's a backyard. Like, I don't even tag me in the shit. I don't want to see it. Yeah, it pisses me off. <laughs> but the thing is, like, with Graver, like, G Graver with the tattoo needles, that doesn't bother me. He asked me. I was like, you know, that's tattoo needles and you're a tattoo artist. It's similar, but it's not. It's a different item, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, that's more of an homage than everybody else literally taking the skewers. And regardless of whatever color they color them, I mean, it's it's skewers. And, I mean, one thing that I always appreciated about your matches, and again, you never relied on them for the psychology of the match from the start to the middle. It was always at, like, the end, you know? Like, yeah. right, it was sort of like your, this is what I'm going to do right before the finishing move, and that's good psychology. You know, not in the yeah. beginning or the middle of the match. Yeah, that's one of the things that always got frustrating because a lot of American promoters are like, did you bring the skewers? And it's like, I don't use them every match. Because a lot of things was based on like, either in tournaments where I already had like history with guys, where it's like, I barely beat them, you know, with my finisher. So this is like my added thing to like, really get to them. Like when I wrestled Mamasasaki, 
you know, it's funny because like we worked in Big Japan so many times and like it was always back and forth in our matches or who was up, who was down. So that match, when it pains the limit, I think it's the second one or maybe it's the first. I can't really remember. But there's a part where I have him down finally and I'm trying to get the skewers on my back pocket, trying to get out. And I hear the crowd are kind of like, eh. So then I just took them all and just stabbed them in his head and punched them in and that turned into the finish. STF with the skewers. And then uh, before I was just doing individually. I'd stick you, stick you, stick you, let you feel this a little bit. And then do a move on top of it, you know. But, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, exactly, you know, gimmick infringement. <laughs> you yeah. did it first, people. Right. You know what I mean, like I said, back in two, with like promoters, like, did you bring your skewers? Like, uh, no. <laughs> like, I'd be like, yeah, sure, come here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, never mind. Yeah. In his head. You know, but, in my uh, back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I got put my my skewers in my pocket. I always have them. They're like my beanie. I constantly have it. (laughs) That's right. I never see you without the beanie. Love the beanie. But um, (laughs) pertaining to the first question, though, uh, if the opportunity came to sign an American deal with one of the four that are on television right now, um, I know in the past uh, there was hesitation. But at this point in your life or career, uh, would you accept an offer? I mean, like I said before, like I'm gonna accept the offer if it's something where it's like I'm not on 24 seven on the road because I got a taste of that, like in Japan, of wrestling every day, being in the tour bus, and even in Europe. You know, it's kind of like, man, there's like you don't have a life. You know, wrestling and everybody thinks it's this great lifestyle and like it's so awesome, but and it's pretty lonely and it gets depressing. You know, so if it's mm-hmm. a schedule where I could literally go to the weekend and wrestle and come back home, that'd be great. You know, I don't know what AEW schedule is. I know Impact was doing stuff like that um, and Ring of Honor, but I mean, honestly, it's like with ROH, they brought me in 11 years later just to put over Roderick, and then he went to WWE. And I don't wrestle in North Carolina, like, but the crowd's 50-50, and then it's like, I draw money, and if you don't want to, I don't know, book me, push me, whatever, you know. I've asked too many times, like, hey, I want to come back. I want to come back. And I'm not playing that game of, like, I'm going to kiss your ass and massage your feet to get a spot. Like, I'm not doing it. You know, that may sound pretty prideful, but end of the day, it's like, I see how guys are, and they're constantly on the social media and constantly, like, up people's butts like trying to get a job and i've just never been that type of person you know but we'll see man i mean like i said wwe people in wwe know who i am half the roster i've worked with i mean look at impact look at aew uh i can't say the same for ring of honor because there's a lot of new talent but majority of the guys that are signed I've, i've worked with you know it's like a joke with my wife. I was like, 10, 15 years from now, I better be in somebody's WWE book. <laughs> like, I better be in a lot of books because I helped a lot of guys out before they were anybody. We well, are in my book. That's all that matters to me. So <laughs> there you go. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's like it's like when I I had the band. Uh, I had Sasha from Halloween on the show, and they had just gotten um, their first number one album in Germany. And I told them flat out, I said, I don't need the validation of a number one album for me to be, say that I'm a fan or that I love the album. So, you know, I mean, Hall of Fames are cool and all that. But, you know, for me, it's like the impact that you make as a wrestler, not as a sports entertainer, as a wrestler. Um, for me, like the great matches that you've had, I mean, I, I, I'll i always be grateful to them because not only do you do good work, but everyone that you work with, and I can think of a bunch of wrestlers that I love seeing you wrestle. There was, you know, your match with Nate Hatred at the first Nick Gage in- I- I- Invitational. There was your match with um, Kevin Steen at Beyond. Um, you know, your match with uh, Davey Richards, you know, at Night of Infamy. I mean, you do good work. And for me, it's no, like, you know, when I say you're the best hybrid wrestler, like, that's not me blowing smoke up your ass. I mean, I have a lot of friends that are pro wrestlers. I'm friends with Dimitri Papadon and uh, Eric Adams. And by the way, they both say hello. And uh, <laughs> Papadon's awesome. Oh, yeah, he's a great awesome. guy. 
Yeah, right yeah. I did an episode with him where we talked about uh, the the Joker, uh, the Batman villain, and all, all the actors who played them. And we all agreed <laughs> that uh, you know Heath Ledger was our favorite. But back to the back to what I was saying. I don't need a Hall of Fame to remind me how good you are in the ring because I still love watching it. Appreciate it. No problem, which actually leads me to my next question. Why I love watching Masada's matches is because he takes the most legitimate things about big brawlers like Bruiser Brody, mix it with great psychology and innovation. He can fly like Hayabusa of FMW. If you don't believe me, watch his old Ring of Honor matches. And in my opinion, Hayabusa was my favorite Japanese wrestler, so rest in peace. And at the same time, you're still you. You're still Masada. I can't say that about a lot of people in your profession because, and this is all due respect to the guys who are working in the ring, it's kind of become homogenized at this point. Everyone seems to be doing light tubes, gusset plates, and carpet strips, and throwing in a couple of wrestling holds here and there. Um, The only other American wrestler that I could say that I enjoy watching as much as I enjoy watching your matches is Schlack. Guns don't kill people. Schlack kills people. Pow! Giddy up! Yeah. He provides, you know, not just the tough guy, crazy man look, but he's also entertaining to watch. For mm-hmm. you, what's been the be- what's been the best personal takeaway about your career so far? Like, you know, when you think about your near 20 year well, at this point, 20 plus years, in the business, what's been the best takeaway for you? I mean, the best thing that's come out of wrestling is just, uh, I guess, honestly, like dealing with people, like social skills, like talking to others, and like I made a lot of friends that ultimately become family. And there's people that are fans of mine that have become friends, you know? That's great. I mean, it's crazy. That's a good question. Hmm. Not exactly sure how to answer that one. I mean, there's been a lot of Jesus good Christ, like, did I just stump Masada? Yeah, you totally did, especially with that that question. No one's ever asked me that. Oh my god, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, mean, I have no idea. <laughs> Let's just I mean, say good matches. <laughs> I'm, no fan of me, I'm, oh God, no. I'm really going to be thinking about that like tomorrow. Oh like, no, what have I done? <laughs> should have answered that one better. There should be more to it. <laughs> oh my God. So, I mean, ultimately, it's like I could say this, you know, being a kid from Beaumont, Texas, what's been great about wrestling is I've gotten to see the world more than a handful of times and been on world tours and like places I've never would have ever thought about ever seeing, you know, just dreaming as a kid, you know, it's crazy before the pandemic happened. Like I had an opportunity to go to Australia and, uh, my wife and I were like seriously thinking about it and then COVID hit. So it's like, uh, damn, that sucks. And that's kind of like the thing now, like I said before, like with wrestling with my wife, my wife goes to every event I'm on, you know, and it's great because I remember before, like, I wrestled in England. I was over there for a month, and there was, like, one of the arenas that we worked in, like, across the sea was France. And it was, like, so cool, so badass, but it's, like, you have nobody to share it with. You're there alone. So it's just, like, one of those things in memory that's stuck in my mind of, you know, wow, this is really lonely. <laughs> but I think a lot of good things with, with wrestling, you know. I've always said this before, wrestling doesn't define me as a person. You know, I'm not so uh, bloodthirsty, backstabbing, like, for a job or spot. Like, I hate that stuff. I think that's one of the things that's really kind of hurt me, too, in the long run of uh, getting signed to a deal because I just won't politic and badmouth people. Like, I'll say it to your face. A lot of people don't like that, but, hey, whatever. Still making the same. (laughs) Again, I'd like to emphasize... I'm wearing your shirt. So okay. if, and <laughs> if I'm wearing your shirt, this means that you've earned my, my respect and appreciation, not just because of your talent in the ring, but also because of your personality. You know, like yeah, I when I hear stuff like that, it's like, oh, thank God there's still honest people in the world. Because, you know, yeah, that, sure. that's that for me. The biggest takeaway that I've had in my relationship with my, with my dad, who passed away from cancer uh, 12, 12 and a half years ago, 
he always said, be the better person, even if it hurts. And when he said that, I understood what he meant, especially in the last 12 years. You know, like I myself, I'm a dad now. And, you know, I've kind of learned in my life, you know, when you meet somebody who's an honest person and won't dick you around, those are the kind of people that you want to gravitate to because they're yeah. going to be the ones that are there for you in the end. And as a fan, that's why I'm still here now and why I wanted to use my platform to promote what you're doing and promote Exile Artifacts. And I'm proud to say, and I apologize that I didn't include this in my original questions, but Masada will be returning to the Northeast in Rochester, New York for the return of Extreme Pro Wrestling, XPW. So if you're li if you're anywhere in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, New England, come from Canada for all I care. Come see this man work at XPW because he's he's for us Northeasterners, he's coming home. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm actually I'm really excited about that one. Uh coming up the rebirth of XPW. And see, that's kind of like the thing that goes back into like a big uh like a big player, because like XPW and ECW folded, like they were on TV. They were doing pay per views, and uh, you know they they reached out to me. You know, so that's what's awesome. We're like somebody sees your talent. Hey, I like what you're doing. I like what you've done in the past. I want you to come with me. I think that I'm honored by that, honestly. Because a lot of times where you're like you're sitting in the mud, you're like, all right, well, Impact hasn't called me. <laughs> ROH ain't returning my emails, and WWE, I just don't even want to go there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Delaney is the one that messaged me. Like Slack had messaged me and said, "Hey Rob, want you to come in for XPW?" And I was like, "XPW is coming back. That's crazy." And then you know that's shortly after I had to be in Mid South, came to death matches. And then uh, you know my wife and I we flew back home. And then Colin messaged me about XPW Rebirth and like the reboot of it. And I was like, "Man, I really." would like to go be a part of it. But the main thing is like stuff from the past, the promotion, I just don't want to be a, a bob lift. So I told Colin my concerns and then he was like, you know, Rob's a completely different guy. He's been sober for several years, got remarried. He's a family man now, runs several business, businesses in Rochester. And he like, owns a burger joint now, I heard. Yeah, like apparently he runs like a few businesses, but the restaurant's like one of the big ones. So I was like, I respect that because, man, like, I, I can't pass any judgment on anybody. You know what I mean? Everybody's got to pass. Like, several years ago, like, you could be like, oh, Masada's just some alcoholic, lunatic, buffoon idiot who uh, constantly tries to fight people. I'm not like that now. But I've been seeing with him for four years. He never tried to fight me. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, I mean, the thing is, like, the main focus from uh, what I gather from talking to Colin and talking to Rob is it's going to be straight up wrestling and a lot of the guys that are on the roster like i know them i've already worked with them there's a no, new guy they just announced bill big dude but I've, I've watched his matches watched his tryout his dark match in aew and that's like somebody hey i look forward to like being in the ring with him just straight up wrestling or even if he wants to go hardcore which i, I don't think we'll be able to do in new york because it's pretty strict but yeah it's a bit stringent here i'm not gonna lie yeah, uh, I mean, but the thing is, ultimate goal with XPW, everybody that's watching this podcast, like, you know, show love, show some respect and put it out there, put the word out there, because ultimately what the main goal is, is to get it back on TV and do pay-per-view events. Hollywood, are you ready? XPW will send a message. November 7th, the most controversial wrestling company in history returns after 18 years. Extreme Pro Wrestling at the Main Street Armory. Masada, Matt Cross, G. Raver, Schlack, Colin Delaney, Willie Mack, and Brian Cage. It's gonna be extreme. I think the thing is, like, jumping from company to talk about it, like, but I think AEW, for what they're doing and what they've done with the independent talent, is awesome. 
Yeah. Like, I, there's nothing I can crap on that promotion about other than bringing in Ponce, but <laughs> I had to say that. But, if, uh, if you want to know more about that story, buy his shoot <laughs> interviews. Give him the money, okay? I'm not giving anything for free that he <laughs> have to pay for. Well, we're talking about backstabbers. It kind of goes in the, with that guy. But, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> but and I mean, it's great. Like, with Nick Gage, like, when they announced Nick Gage, it's like you're giving credit to the Deathmatch fan base, you know, because, like, WWE would, like, stick their nose at that, like, we don't care about CZW. We don't care about Big Japan or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of cool because, like, when Drake got signed as a referee, they actually put pictures on WWE.com of matches with me and Drake on there. But they, it's kind of like WWE likes to pretend things don't exist, which I think really in the long run just it hurts them. Hence and then you have their the usage of the word universe. Because everything yeah. outside of the universe doesn't exist. It's called, you know, th that's their marketing strategy, people. You're not part of any universe. You're part of the same yeah. shit we are. <laughs> it is bad. I mean, cause, like, I mean, ultimately, it deters people from wanting to watch a product. You know what I mean? And then, like, I, I don't really get into, like, rating wars and all that stuff. But from, from my understanding, AEW is higher up with ratings. And... I can see why it's like you're releasing a lot of good talent and they're picking them right up and putting them on TV. So what do you expect? You know, I enjoy watching it because, uh, you know, of some of the names that you just mentioned, not punk, but I mean like, you know, uh, some of the yeah. other respectable names, uh, from the Indies that they actually give shine to. Like I was happy when Papa Don made it. Cause I was like, Hey, that's my boy. You know, uh, yeah doesn't hurt that I mean, it's like I said, yeah there's so many guys that are great talent like they're on there it's like man this guy's been working their asses off in yeah. new york and like northeast and like finally they're catching a break and like there's so much good talent that's come out of new york and the east and the northeast it's like insane you know and they're finally getting their just due and there's a few texas guys in there too you know what i mean mm -hmm. but it kind of goes back into like we talked about before i've worked with every single one of those guys you know i think more or less like with aew it's less political backstabbing i think it's more or less honestly like who are draws and who's gonna actually like sell tickets like nick age versus chris jericho you would never thought that would ever happen not in a million <laughs> freaking <laughs> years <laughs> but that's i was like wait a minute am, i was like am i am i really watching i am watching this and you yeah. know the hilarious thing was you know the gimmick with the pizza cutter and then they switched the commercial and it's Domino's pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's oh. a, that's a crazy thing because you know like Jericho does the uh, the dark side of the ring you know he does the narrating on it so pretty sure like when it comes down to his career he came up through the independence he went to FMW which is a blood and guts company and he knows that there's a fan base there. Mm -hmm. when other people in main office, like in WWE or say even like, I wouldn't say ROH, but ROH has done some blood and gut stuff, but you know, WWE just wouldn't even have anything like that. Like Nick Gage, you know what? You know, like Cornette was pissed, furious that he was on there. And then he brings up his past. It's uh, like, oh, I mean, I just hope that Nick is in a good place in his life. You know, um, yeah. I, I've heard a couple of people state, well, he can't be that clean. And I'm just like, well, he was on AEW. I'm sure he got tested before he go. He went on. And I'm sure that he wouldn't have went on if he wasn't clean. But Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, well, every time I've seen Nikki, it's like he's been 100% and he's not on shit. You know, I can tell if somebody's on something. You know what I mean? As far as when he goes to the back home or a hotel, like, I mean, I just don't see it, you know? Like, I just don't. I think it's like you learn from your past, and you don't need that shit. And he's got such a, you know, strong, hardcore, strong mentality where it's like, I'm not going to go back and take back steps. But, I mean, as my friend, I see him doing better, you know? I'm glad Every time that. I saw him in Tampa, Florida, WrestleMania weekend, um, at 100%, it was 110, honestly. and then. Uh, several months back, he was in Dallas. The same thing, you know. He's always energetic and ready to go. You know, he's passionate about wrestling. You know, and shit. I mean, like I said, it was awesome. You know, because like friends of mine were like, "Yeah, Nick Gage just debuted." I was like, "What?" And like, 
all right, I got to check this shit out. I'm like, <laughs> huge reaction, you know what I mean? I didn't get to watch the match, but I see stuff on YouTube. Like, hell yeah, you know? He's going in and, you know, he's got a, got a reputation, got a background in the industry, and it's good that they highlight that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And the, the, cool, thing is, the cool thing is, too, it's like, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but even, like, um, you know, Sick Nick Mondo, like, does a lot of production for AEW. You know, so it's like people that are like, I guess you would say like snobby, they kind of like shun like the death match scene, the blood and guts and the combat zone, and all the other companies, IW Mid-South. It's kind of like, it's wrestling, whether you like it or not, it's part of the business. You know, there are some things that, hey, I would even agree with fans I don't like. I don't like where the ring is just covered with so much monotonous crap that you don't even need. And guys are just throwing light tubes repetitively, no yeah. selling them. You know, it's like, I'm sorry, but if you're, I'm old school with wrestling. Like, I think honestly, like wrestlers should be bigger guys. You need bigger guys. And if you are 150 pounds or 130 pounds and I'm 231 at 6'2", like I'm a bit stronger than you. So sell it. If you start bashing light tubes over your head that you're crazy, it's like, okay. You just kind of killed, like, the whole lore, you know? Right. You know, I mean, some guys, some guys can pull it off, but it's like when there's just so many, it, it just comes and kind of, like, overkill. It's like, all right, guys, you know, get on the whey protein, like, put some weight on, hit the gym, you know? I hear it. No, so, you're right. I mean, part of the, you know, part of the art, is being able to sell the look and sell the realism behind it. That's why, you know, when people say, forgive me for saying this, because I don't believe it, when people say wrestling is fake. And I'm like, okay, yes, it's predetermined. Yes, it's an art form. Yes, you need to know what you're doing. Yes, it hurts, you know. But on top of all those things, there is the believability in what the two athletes in the ring are doing it's meant to make you emotionally invested in what's going on. So in that case, right. it's very real. And right. this is why when I hear people say this, I'm just like, all right, you know what? It's not for you. It's not even a matter of them, you know, suspending um, disbelief. It's just appreciating what you and whoever you're in there with are doing to make us want to emotionally invest in what you're doing. And I'm happy to say that with everyone that you've wrestled, it's always been on the level. You know, like I believed when I saw you in there with Joker. I believed when I saw you literally being the crap out of Ido Ruji. I believe it, even though your relationship with Jun Kasai, outside of what you have in the ring, is one where there's respect. Yeah, you want to kill each other because. Yeah you're making us emotionally invested in what it is you're doing. And that's yeah. the, that's the art behind it, whether it's death match, whether it's high flying. I appreciate that. I think like a main thing too, like when you talk about the art form, I think a lot of things have gotten really kind of watered down and misconstrued with death match wrestling. And like, and the whole point of a death match is to prove the realism of wrestling because nobody is willingly going to get thrown to Bob wire glass light tubes that kind of goes back to what i was saying where guys are willingly like screwing their bodies up it's like he kind of just killed that whole that fantasy allure of like this is shoot you know but absolutely that's I, could, I, could, I could ramble on about that for hours on that like, oh, man, I, know, I, I, I know we're pressed for like time. what you are you get doing dude like, like you're 100 pounds and like i'm too 2.30, and, like, I'm kind of like, I just got killed. Like, somebody shot me with a shotgun. Here you are, like, <laughs> Well, all I'm going to say is this. Yeah. To all the promoters out there, don't book him against Marco Stunt. He'll kill him. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I like Marco, but let me, let's get serious. CZW is where you called your home in the U.S. for many years. You even moved mm -hmm. to New York at one point in 2017 to be closer to the wrestling community and work around there. However... Yeah. With every card that was showing in my feed, and I mean my social media feed, there was one wrestler I barely saw, and that was you. This mm -hmm. made me not disinterested in you, but disinterested in Northeast Wrestling Promotions, who do not take advantage of talent when it becomes available to them. 
what was going on in your mind at this time as this was happening? I mean, the, the thing that's crazy is like, okay, so starting off, you know, in Texas and then going to Georgia and then doing the trials sort of TNA and WWE and then going to ROH. It's like the Northeast is like awesome. Like it's a ruthless fan base of like, if you, if you can get over in the Northeast, then you can get pretty much over anywhere. But I've always loved that greediness atmosphere of like the, the way the crowd pops and how they react to everything. It's awesome. It's amazing. But yeah, when I actually lived in New Jersey for two years and I moved back to Texas and then I moved to New York because a lot of promoters I was talking to were like, yeah, we'll put you on every show. We'll pay you this amount of money and uh, we'll push you. I get there and okay, so where's all these shows? And I'm like, oh, well, we got something in the works. We got something planned. It's like, you have me here. Like, what the hell, dude? And that's like kind of like what we were talking about earlier. It's like getting really depressed where it's like, man, this is not where I want to be. You know, it's not my home state. Like, yeah, I have friends out there, but it's totally alien to me. You know, I'm a Texas guy, you know, I honestly don't know what's up with that. Like with the promoters, you know, because like a lot of them I was talking to is like, we'll promise you this. We'll promise you all these dates. We'll get you like three to four bookings a week. And then the next thing you know, it's like, oh, it's down to one or it's down to nine. And I honestly don't know what the reasoning behind that was. But I mean, I stuck it out there for a year and I was like, you know what? I'm out. I'm going back home. And then I started working in Mexico, you know, Bestia 666 and his, uh, his dad, Damien, they started booking me in the crash, you know, started going to Tijuana. And then I started focusing more on Texas promotions and a lot of fans like on social media, like a lot of negativity on social media. That's why I'm rarely ever on it. But a lot I don't of blame people, you. But a lot of people in that, that period of time, they would get like, you know, your name's mentioned in a comment. Like, people were like, where's Masada at? And somebody made the comment like, oh, he's back in Texas working shindies. And it's like, okay, that's a, that's a stab. But the thing is, little they know, like those smaller promotions are actually paying me what I want and putting me against guys I wanted to work with, you know? So... It's all balanced out. The funny thing is, the ironic thing is, you know, when you leave and then people are like, oh, shit, we want him back. You know what I mean? That's kind of like in my career, it's always been like that, where they have me and then the promoter has me and they push me a little bit. And it's like if they go ball to the wall like CZW did, I'm going to make you money. We're all going to make money and do world tours. And... uh you know, just being absent of being like six gold of like, okay, well, I don't accept what you're offering me and I'm not going to do that to my body for what you're willing to pay me. I know I'm worth more than that. I'll go home. You know what I mean? I'll go and work in my shop and, you know, do something I love doing. And that's one of the things I told Drew Gulak in that time period. It was like with wrestling, there's two things. Either you better be having fun with it or you better be making money because if you're not making money and you're not having fun in it, then you need to step away and don't get consumed in all the negativity. And ultimately that's what I had to do. I came back to Texas and I was having fun, you know, um, working with the guys I've known for years and, uh, it just only honestly uh, good people, you know what I mean? Like Bessia, Damien, Nicho, Psychosis, uh, LA park, the original La Parca, Mexico really got me back to being hungry again for wrestling because Mexico wrestling is just like it's business and it's tradition. The United States turns into like this big cluster of just blended crap where it's like, all right, <laughs> like you're telling me we're going this direction, but it's going like this and it goes to no big end story of like why we're even doing that. And then probably next month you'll just kill it anyway because you don't know what the hell you're doing. But that that's kind of like a thing. we all know, but I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fans are pretty smart. They, they know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, I had to, re, you know, refine myself. And then, like, it's crazy because, like, you know, I, my wife and I were just at IW Mid-South. And I've known In Rodden for years. And I've always loved In. In has been great to me. A lot of guys, like, talk shit. And the thing is, I would hear the, the backstories of the reason why. It's like, if the man didn't promise you a guarantee and he's going off the door or off the gate and there's 20 or 30 people, 
well, that's on your fault. That's your problem because one, you didn't draw anything because your name isn't that strong. And if you want to get pissed off because he said, hey, if I have this much, if I have a big draw, I'll pay you this. But if nobody's there, how's he supposed to do that? Running off the gate. You know, I've always told him, and it's always been an understanding. It's like, I want to guarantee, and he's always made that happen. And in times like there wasn't that many fans, hey, I understand. You know what I mean? I'm not going to go home and I'll never work for that guy again. He's an asshole. Bullshit. And Ron is one of the guys that actually really helped get me back in the United States. And him getting me back in the United States from Japan is what ultimately got me into Europe. And it was me going to IWM itself, the first King of the Death matches, is what got me in CZW. Because honestly, back in the day, I didn't even want to work there. I wanted to go back to Ring of Honor. You know? So, and, you know, it's helped me out a lot. And the crazy thing is, and the cool thing is, and it's kind of sad because when I was in that self-destructive mode, like, Ian told me, like, the first night of the tournament, he's like, I can't tell you how happy I am to see you back at being Brig and being the Masada I know and love. Because I was so worried about you, like, you have no idea. You know, I thought you were going to be another statistic. And it's, it's like, man, that, that hits hard. And my wife was there, and she knows. because She's lived it. She's been there. You know, like I said, we were friends before we got married, and, like, so you know this all like ups and downs and you know who your real friend your friends are. And I think like it goes back to like people that are real in this business get so much crap because they're real. And will tell you what's up. You know what I mean? He doesn't panty waste around anything. He'll tell you how he feels and I respect that. Well, I, you know? I agree with him because like I said, it's it's not hard to emotionally invest in what you're doing. You you've always given my goodness, hundred and twenty percent every time you go out there. Like people, I've been asked, can you name one bad Masada match? No, I can't. So, you know, it's like I said, it's, 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 it's good to see that you're in a place in your life where, you know, you're just happier. If, if yeah, that's the word that I can use. <laughs> yeah, happier. I mean, it kind of like, I didn't really get to the point, but me, me going, it's like things started opening up, you know, like my whole schedule was for the year of going back to New York, going to Detroit, going to Florida, going to Georgia, and then uh, even Australia was on the table. And then when the pandemic happened, it just went, you know, luckily, like, I work an actual job now. It's like I work at my nine to five, like I'm a metal fabricator, you know, so it's great. Like, I get to go to shop, uh, fabricate metal, and then I get to come home and then work in my shop here. And then wrestle, you know, that's ultimately like, and spend time with my, my family. That's, that's ultimately beautiful. like, you know, you can't take that away. And I'm blessed because honestly, with the pandemic, my job, we never took any time off. And the great thing is like also with my job is like, they let me take time off for wrestling. They knew beforehand that this is what I do. This is what I've been doing for the longest time. So anytime I need days off, they give it to me. So I'm happy. I'm blessed by that, you know? Wrestling's a, great, great but it, wrestling's great, but it's just not consistent. It's not consistent money flow unless you're under contract. I know. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It's rough. It's like it's the same thing as being in a band. You know, it's like ooh, better push that merch. You know, better or hope something good comes out. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, I totally hear that. Um, especially around here, where venues are closing left and right, but neither here nor there. So a uh, couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay. So James Lilliquist, who is a co-host of one of the other podcasts on Ratsaw Review, which is my parent podcast, uh, his show is called Beyond Bushido, where they watch Japanese and um, uh, Japanese wrestling and also mixed martial arts. Um, he mentioned in a podcast that I did with him that one of his favorite Masada moments was during mm -hmm. Wrestle Circus when it was a kid friendly event. During your match, Space Monkey comes out and brings all the kids in the arena to a different area of the venue so that this way they wouldn't see the, the, the your match knowing what would eventually occur. Uh, do you have any recollection of this match? Uh, that's my debut with uh, Wrestle Circus, I believe, right? With Brody yeah. King. Yeah, okay, yeah. The funny thing is, like, that was supposed to be a three-way dance, and I don't remember why they changed it, but I do remember that. 
but I was more or less like into the match where like that really just see that like where's all the kids <laughs> like <laughs> yeah hey, I mean it's pretty I mean oh, that's, that's like, how, like yeah oh, he's a great guy I mean that's like the cool thing is too it's like when you meet people like you've heard of and I'm you know they've heard of me and it's like when you meet and there's like chemistry and you get along really well I mean, like from totally two different walks of the wrestling world, you know, it's really cool. But yeah, I do remember that because I just remember like fighting with Brody. It's like I remember seeing like you know a lot of families here, and like it just looks like I don't know, kind of like CZW now, where it's like all adults. And then our match was over, and then like I was out selling merch. So like, okay, well, what the hell happened with all the kids? I do kind of recall that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't know the real reason, but, I, but yeah. Final question. If people want to know more about Masada, Brigham Doan, and Exiled Artifacts, where on the interweb can the people find out more? So go to Official Masada on Instagram. Um, you know, it's like everything, it, send me a request and then I'll accept you. Um, but also like Facebook, Exiled Artifacts, or Brigham Paul Doan Masada on Facebook. There's a official Masada Twitter, which I'm rarely on because I think Twitter is a waste of time. I don't have hey, enough Twitter. time. To, I, I can't really stand it either. But I, I don't have enough time in the day to just write things and like. I mean, literally, as soon as I get up, I get up at six in the morning, and I work till three thirty, and I, I drive home, and then I work out, and then I make my orders and go and train in the ring. So. That's one of the cool things too. It's like lately, it's like I actually been motivated to get hit the weights, hit the gym, and then do some in ring training because I feel like a lot of things are pretty rusty on, especially with the whole pandemic. It's like I didn't get any ring time in, so a lot of things I'm working on and like getting back to technical and like moving around the way I need to. And I think pretty soon, like if you're on my Instagram, you'll start seeing some uh, videos come up of me uh, technical chain wrestling, submission wrestling. You know, the thing is, like, I've always got the bad stiff, stiff of, like, uh, he's a blood and guts guy, but why is he doing, like, a top wrist lock into a hammer lock? Oh, shit, he just went around the world. And, you know, was wrestling before anything, you know? There but, was one thing I said on the first episode that I posted on YouTube of Music is Live podcast, and this is when I was doing a uh, a retrospective of ECW with Wayne Noon, my co-host from Outside Review, and with Eric Adams. Eric asked me, and we both kind of agreed, that the one wrestler that we think would have been probably the best for ECW because of the hybrid style would have been you. Because truth is, you're just... And, and, and I will take this to the grave with me. You're more than just a deathmatch wrestler. You're... Like I said, if, if you wanted to fly, uh, do high flying stuff, you could. Technical, you could. Brawling, you could. There's not that many people that you could say can do all that. And right. I still stand by this today. If, if ECW, which growing up was my favorite promotion, uh, especially being from Queens, New York, and going to the Elks Lodge to see them, if they were still here, it would have been great to have seen them make it further because of someone of your skill set. And, you know, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I was ultimately like a goal for me was to go to ECW and go to FMW. So when both those companies closed, it was like I went to the next big thing, you know, after they folded. For me, it was like ECW, like, you know, XBW was in the West Coast, but to me, it's always all eyes are on the East Coast. I've always have heard that through Rudy Boy and Sean, like, everybody's watching the Northeast. You know, I honestly, I don't know why that is, but it, I mean, it's great, you know. Couldn't tell you either, but man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's, the, it's the truth, you know. It's like everybody watches like East Coast independent wrestling. It's not like, uh, it's not like the territory days where Texas had like big, big wrestling fan base. And ah, uh, the days followed. of the Von Erics. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could say honestly, like, it's great because, like, when I was a kid, like, wrestling was on every day on ESPN. So when I would get home from school, like I could watch AWA, I could watch World Class, um, I could watch Global, you know, it was always on, you know. So I kind of got the in parts of the territory days, like in the 80s, but, you know, wrestling, 
wrestling in Texas, like the shows, like it, things are picking back up. But I think honestly, it's such a big state where maybe fans just aren't that smart to wrestling. Like, oh shit, like this guy's going to get signed to WWE. They just focus on what's on TV. You know, I'm not saying all of them, but I say majority of them. I think I'm, the thing is like the. I'm just as guilty of that. Um, I didn't discover yeah. ECW until 97, and this was right before Barely Legal uh, was on pay-per-view. It just so happened that I saw a promo for it on a pay-per-view channel, and I was like, what is this? I didn't mm -hmm. know anything about professional wrestling leagues outside of WWE or WCW. I didn't really know about it until I discovered ECW, and then I discovered a whole world of it, happening in my backyard and oh, yeah. you know i follow a lot of the athletes uh, not not to say oh yeah i remember when you know before they became it's like i'm always looking for something new to keep me interested and you know but in the end the word on the marquee is wrestling and yeah. you know i always want to make sure that whoever i'm watching has the goods for me to do that emotional investment in them. And, yeah. you know, as a fan, I just want to say thank you for always being honest, not bullshitting the fans and, you know, just giving of yourself every time you go in the ring, you know, it's an honor to watch your stuff. And, you know, it's, it's an honor to have you on my little rinky ding podcast <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's great to call you a friend and, uh, I, I appreciate you and everything you do. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me on and we'll do this again. Promise. Awesome. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe after XPW. So one of the things I wanted to plug real quick. So Bruiser Brody Cup is actually going on. Bruiser Brody Cup 2 is going on in Texas, uh, November 5th and 6th. So I'm in that, that tournament. And then literally as soon as that tournament's over, I'm going to drive to Dallas and then fly to Rochester to do XPW's World Tournament. So I'm excited about that weekend. It's going to be brutal, but I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Goddamn, Bruiser Brody was awesome. Shoot. <laughs> oh, he definitely was. I mean, oh man, the scars on his head. And the funny thing, like, I mean, I know that, you know, you've had uh, scarring, but it's not as bad as his was. No, I mean, no. he was he's one step below Abdullah, but still pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, I don't ever want that. I remember one time, my I was looking at my forehead. I, I think I was like, just looking in the camera. I was like, "Oh man, my head's looking like hamburger meat." <laughs> and, my, and like, it, and it did. It was like some pink, white scarring. It's a scar from scars. So I started actually using like coconut lotion to get that to go away. I mean, it's not as bad as it was, but man, I definitely don't want to look like a Cleon or something. something <laughs> <laughs> First time I met Wing Cannon Moore, he told me a funny story. I'll tell this real quick. He, uh, first time he came to, uh, the United States, he was Smoky working for Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Mountain. right? Yeah. So go he was ahead. working for Smoky. Have you heard this story? Please go ahead. You can tell it. Absolutely. Okay. So, like when he flew in, like he came to the airport and like, I guess when he was leaving or whatnot, like kids were pointing at his head and saying he was a Cleon because of like his scars on his head. <laughs> so. I was like, man, I never want to be like, uh, look at that guy. He looks like a freaking alien. Oh, like my one God. Of the other and I'm not a Star Trek fan, but it's like, yeah, I mean, everybody <laughs> knows what Cleon is. Like, come on, like, what the hell? Yeah. If you no, get that comparison, it's like, basically, your forehead's so ugly, it looks like a freaking snapping turtle shell. Like, <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> no, like, that's not the all. story. That's not the story that I heard. I heard, uh, uh, the, the story that I heard was that, you know, he, he came to, uh, to Smoky Mountain and, uh, you know, I think it was either Jim Cornette or um, Kevin Sullivan. No, I think it was Kevin Sullivan said to Jim Cornette, he's a bleeder. Yeah, he'll bleed. And Jim Cornette's like, good, we need a bleeder. And, you know, he did the gig and like mood a scale level. And yeah, uh, yeah I, could, I, I could just imagine the kids in the arena being scared shitless at that. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it is crazy because, I mean, like, wrestling back then wasn't so, uh, I don't know, so labeled. It's like wrestling was wrestling. And if guys did, like, death matches or hardcore because they hated each other, it wasn't right. off and stuff. It just kind of went with the business, you know what I mean? It's like, 
you're going to do this. You're a tough, crazy wrestler. And, you know, that is what it is. Which, now everything is all segregated. You know what I mean? Yeah. But this yeah. is why, you know, when people say, you know, who's who's one of your favorite wrestlers, I tell them Masada. And, like, you know, again, this is not me blowing smoke up your ass, but I tell people to watch your matches and tell me that that's not, you know, a grade A match that he put on, like, from start to finish. You know, there's more to you than being deathmatch. And I just, you know, I, I feel bad. I, I feel bad when the stigma falls on guys like you because you provide so much more than just, you know, what people expect or what people hear. But you know what, though? I mean, you're still at a point in your career where I think you still, I, th I think you have yet to show the world what you can do, you know? And I think it's, uh, I just think it's great that, you know, you're home in Texas, you know, with your lovely wife, you know, you're with your, your daughter, you're with family, you're with friends, and you're at a place where, you know, you could do your business and you're providing for your family. You know, it's like, what more could you want for someone that you could say that, you know, you're a fan of? And, you know, I, um, I just wish you all the best, Masada. And, you know, I'm, again, very grateful that you came on the show and spent an hour of your time with me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And like I said, again, we'll do this again. You know, after after XPW, let's make a date and let's uh, let's talk again. You know, definitely. definitely. And I will I will do my best to come to the XPW show. Uh, the only thing stopping me, um, well, I have a three year old daughter, so you know, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> responsibilities gotcha. responsibilities. Uh, you know, are. Uh, a big thing for me. This is my guy's night out, if you will, and I'm and I'm home. But <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Hey, no worries, I get it. <laughs> but I, I hope to come, and uh, you know, if I do, I'll let you know. And uh, if I do, I'll let you know. And if you want to check out more about the podcast, check me out over at musicislivepodcast.com. Don't forget to check out our parent network, ratsalreview.com. Check out the other podcasts on the show. We also got Beyond Bushido. We got the Right Opinion. We got, please don't laugh when you hear this, Suck My Balls, which is our South Park podcast. <laughs> I made Masada laugh. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and also check out some of our other podcasts on the show, including the uh, Screams for the Grave, where we talk about metal albums from the past that people forget. Rats Eye Review Theater, where we make fun of videos from the past that deserve to be made fun of. And, mm -hmm. you know, just go check it out. Subscribe like the videos comment we do respond back we make fun of each other we'll make fun of you too but it's all about good fun but yeah. anyways we're gonna wrap this up so once again Brigham paul doan masada thank you i appreciate it thank you cheers sir and remember all art is valid have a good night Ultraviolet Beast himself. I think I said ultraviolet. Oh, fuck. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I work in UV, so let me say <laughs> okay. that again. <laughs> it's okay. That's an outtake. I'm very.